Lars has arrived in Coronian lands. The territory of ancient Corland consisted of several kingdoms formed around castles or kilikundas. Scandinavian merchants and artisans had been building settlements in Corland since the middle of the first millennium and established close trade relations with the nearby Gotland. Yet, written sources mention wars and raids between the Coronians, Swedes and Danes more frequently than trade. For several centuries, the Coronians partially ruled the Baltic Sea. But from the 13th century onwards, North German merchants took advantage of the Crusades to gain control of the old trade routes that later turned into the Hanseatic League. Sensing that their former might was fading, the Coronians attacked the Christian center Riga in 1210. After a three-day siege, Crusader reinforcements arrived, forcing the Coronians to retreat. They gathered their fallen and spent three more days nearby, mourning and burning their dead. The Coronians were like wild beasts. They would not give up their forest and be domesticated to live like cattle with foreign masters. But they had learned the same simple truth I had. If you can't beat them, join them. Hoping to avoid terrible bloodshed in endless battles against the Germans, Danes and Swedes, the Coronians adopted the Christian faith with the Pope's blessing. Yet it was clear to me that the Coronians only called themselves Christians to fool their foreign masters, because the pagans were not about to forget their ancestral gods. Moreover, at the time of the winter solstice, I witnessed the Coronians hunting in their sacred forest, where during the previous year they never killed a beast, nor did they fell a single tree. During the solstice, the shortest day of the year, the pagans wore masks, believing they held the spirits of their ancestors, which let them communicate with their dead relatives and the gods of nature. Lamekins had heard that a neighboring tribe, the Samogitians, were preparing a battle against the German crusaders. So he offered to sell a large number of weapons to the Samogitian duke, Vikintas. Although they often quarreled and warred, this was no obstacle to a mutually beneficial deal. I would laugh if I weren't crying at how remarkably and insistently fate kept throwing obstacles in my way. Glamekins sold me for a wineskin full of expensive wine.
And so, in the winter of the year of our Lord, 1235, I was sent to Samogitia along with the Curonian shipment of weapons. Duke Vikintas rode ahead with his riders and village elders, and we followed behind more slowly as we were encumbered by the amount of goods. On the way, I once again realized that the given word was not to be trusted. The Samogitians could expect kindness, hospitality, and care from Lamekins. But despite the agreed upon truce, my companions attacked simple Coronian folk, fishing on the ice, and robbed them of their catch. But such was the custom, and the Coronians would not have acted any differently given the opportunity. 